uh, John makes two claims, and one of them he called his, uh, his second question, and that's the, he's making a claim that uh, parties in, in the American tradition have established themselves or organized themselves to make claims about constitutional principles, and they want judges, and especially Supreme Court judges, to lock in the principles. And on that claim, I'm strongly in agreement. I enjoyed that very much, and I don't have a lot to say. I have a couple of quibbles and one reaction, and John could take them for what they were. The reaction is that what uh, I just want to stress that when, when John talked about the things that were, the principles that were most important to what I'll call loosely the Reagan governing coalition, though I agree with John that it's not clear that Reagan ever established a governing coalition, note that he focused on issues having to do with the 14th Amendment, Roe v. Wade uh, and uh, race discrimination. He might also have added school prayer. And for we law professors, we think about the Rehnquist Court, we think about federalism. But to the kinds of people who established the Reagan Governing Coalition, federalism was either not on the radar screen or just at the edges of it. And I just want to stress the deep separation between the interests of rank and file citizens and the politicos who organize a party and the law specialists who focus on it. And I, I just find that interesting. Two qualifications. One, well, in the story that John tells, I agree with the role that he says about parties. I might say that parties aren't quite as influential, or they haven't been for the last 50 years, as they were 150 years ago, just because I think that the legal academy and public intellectuals who focus on the court system do play the inter run more interference between adjudication and parties than was done 100 years ago. And the other qualification is more specific to Judge Bork. He, John posits that Judge Bork was done in a large part because of his opinions uh, spoken about race discrimination. I agree with that, but I think one thing that was distinctive about the Bork confirmation process is that it was the first one where grassroots groups and groups with media <coughs> access tried to nationalize a confirmation hearing for political uh, gain uh, to, to stoke divisions between the two parties about the role of the courts. So then on to what John called his first question about uh, the role of judicial virtue. And here I have deeper disagreements. And I'm going to run with a few different, I guess the deep disagreement is that John assumes a, a, a term, an understanding of virtue that I, under, I understand where it comes from and it has precedent. It, to me it's not a usage of virtue that is as in accordance with commonsensical usages and it's not as uh, consistent with usages of virtue in worked out, as worked out by scholars who do a lot of work on virtue theory. And so I want to give a couple of different, more specified versions of virtue and, and suggest that maybe a different story could arise out of these. So one possible, what John defines virtue to be attachment to the common good. And in common sense usage and then in Aristotelian virtue theory, virtue relates to the common good, but virtue is not reducible to the common good. Uh, being loyal to the common good is, might not even be a virtue. It might be a precondition of being a virtuous person, but it's not <coughs> virtue in itself. Or if it is, it's one virtue, just public spiritedness, but there are other virtues that need to be exercised in conjunction with um, public spiritedness. And separately, uh, after that, John uh, drew a contrast between, uh, the pro he talked about the problem of being a judge. What seems virtuous to the legislature might not be to the judge. I think the point is right, but I think it is made stronger to specify better. There, the virtue of public spiritedness might be one dimension of virtue, and there might be other dimensions of virtue where you're talking about virtue that is specific to an institutional role. And I think here the thing to understand is that legislators and judges both can care about the common good and from their own perspective implement it. But what you have to understand is that in a well-worked-out virtue theoretic account of politics, the common good includes, in large part, people exercising freedom that's been specified by law. And legislators try to write the laws and show excellence of virtue in writing the right laws. And the judges show excellence by applying the law. And so, judges, so legislators do interact with their opinions about the common good and apply more directly to what they do in their functions because their functions require them to deliberate about the common good and try to approximate the common good in written work. 
The judge, by contrast, just has to follow someone else's written opinion about what the common good is. But the basic point's right if qualified differently. Now, if role excellence is a virtue in that sense, another interesting thing that John's paper does is to talk about the possibility that virtue is contingent or relative to different communities. And this is, I think, another great point. Uh, Aristotle had a wonderful discussion of politics, how the good oligarch can't be a good Democrat, and the good Democrat can't be a good oligarch. And I think there's something to that. Now, from that, I would have thought what would follow that there's really deep and separable divisions in how progressive judges, I'll call them, and originalist judges, I'll call them, understand judicial virtues. And I was surprised in that John's paper tended to minimize those. And here I'm referring to the parts of his talk in his paper. He talked about this passage that uh, Harry, Judge Harry Edwards had made, saying that 85% of the cases are easy, 10%. Lawyers have to think, but they, they will come to the right answer, and 5% are ideological. I'm not sure whether I think that the 5% is 25%, or the 5% ends up infecting like 45% of what's left, <laughs> or the 5% is real, uh, it, it's really important, even if it's just 5%, but I'm not comfortable with that part of the paper. And here, I'm thinking in part, for example, of an uh, essay that Judge Bork wrote in First Things. I, I couldn't find it, I'm sorry to say, uh, I'll, I'll keep looking. But he complained, he was talking about the Supreme Court over the last 50 years, and he complained that one of the big vices of the Warren Court was that the Warren Court was as cavalier in cases about tax as it was about constitutional doctrine. Now, that's changed since the Rehnquist Court, but it might have changed because <coughs> Justice Scalia has been on the court to scold some of the progressive justices about sloppy statutory interpretation. And maybe if, for example, Justice Souter was a good statute, a good textualist in statutory cases, but then not so much so on school prayer cases, that's the hypocrisy that vice pays the tribute that vice, hypocr uh, how's it go? Hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays the tri uh, virtue. That was the tribute that Scooter was paying to Scalia. And then last, in virtue can mean excellence. This, something is admirable, somebody is so outstanding that people are drawn to be attracted to it. And the kind of virtue, if virtue is just attachment to the common good, it's a lot lower it's, uh, it, than that. It's easier to satisfy. And that left me wondering about the portrait that John Pick paints of Judge Bork. A lot of the things, when, when John says in his paper that Judge Bork was virtuous or he embodied a kinder virtue that the Reagan coalition would wanted, that's a thin statement. You could say the same of Chief Justice Rehnquist, of uh, Justice Scalia, of uh, Justice Thomas, of uh, Judge Ginsburg, of uh, Judge Silverman, and others. So I want to suggest a different account of Judge Bork that relies on some of these other understandings of uh, virtue that I've talked about. And these are, I think, more particular to Judge Bork. For that reason, they are also made the good parts more moving, but the parts that are possibly critical are a little uncomfortable. There's no question that Judge Bork was a public spirit. And here is a passage from his confirmation uh, testimony. He was asked by a senator why he wanted to be in the Supreme Court, and he answered, I'd like to leave a reputation as a judge who understood constitutional governance and contributed his bit to maintaining it in the ways I've described before this committee. Our constitutional structure is the most important thing this nation has, and I'd like to ma help maintain it and be remembered for that. <laughs> and Judge Bork, I think, was an, a role excellent judge, too. I mean, his account of original meaning and the role of the judge made a huge impact on the judiciary. And he was also a role excellent before being a judge as an intellectual, both in antitrust and then also in constitutional on how many academics could have made as much impact as they did as he did in two really different fields. But then back to this question of, of virtue being regime or context contingent. And here there are two questions that I think have to be asked. One is what see what makes Judge Bork an excellent judge from the perspective of originalists or constitutionalists might make him a vicious judge from the perspective of what I've called uh, so far progressivist judges. Um, we hear, and this is, we, you hear the kinds of things that Democratic senators say about judges who are strict constructionists, and they, the kinds of virtu uh, virtues that Judge Bork embodies are still very controversial in our political life today. So I guess that makes me a little bit more pessimistic about our, our judges going forward than John seemed to be. And last, Judge Bork, because he was such an intellectual force, 
and because he was good, there were parts, I think, of his confirmation process that were, I think, there were senators who might have not been totally comfortable with him because he was a force. And there's some parts of a democratic politics, there's a little bit of envy and a little bit of desires by people who are good Democrats to see people who are really excellent lower themselves and not be too out in front of the popular people. And I think that some members of the Senate felt that way or a little uncomfortable around Judge Bork during his confirmation. And that, too, makes me a little bit more uncomfortable than John is about the possibility of letting virtue be part of the judicial branch. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have some time for a few uh, reactions from the members of the panel. Uh, I don't, yeah. Sure, thank you. Uh, well, the Times uh, illustration was an excellent one. Uh, but I'd like it to note that I have elsewhere in writing referred to Jefferson Parish case and the Times rule as the last man standing from the Ancien Regime. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only case that, yet that, need, that has long deserved to be overruled. I think it was resolved in order to, uh, because of the necessity of Justice O'Connor's fifth vote. Uh, now, a footnote on Justice Stevens having been the author of Independent Inquisit and of, um, of Jefferson Parish. This uh, came to my attention uh, through the, uh, the oral channels that have been so much prominent in uh, today's remarks, and particularly with the, uh, Henry, Big Henry's uh, account of his relationship with our, uh, our honorees. Uh, George Priest has a student recently. Um, the granddaughter of Aaron Director, I believe it was. Um, in any event, this student, uh, who had personal knowledge, uh, told George that in the uh, 1950s, when Aaron and, um, and uh, uh, Phil Neal were uh, co-teaching antitrust, I'm sorry, Ed Levy, before Neal came out, uh, Ed Levy were teaching antitrust, uh, there was a time when, uh, for one reason or another, um, uh, Ed was not available, and uh, John Paul Stevens co-taught that course with Aaron Director. And I'm confident that he brought more understanding of this field to uh, the court than probably anyone else that served during his time. Uh, he was instrumental in some of the other decisions as well. Lewis Powell was another person who had a lot to, lot to contribute. Um, but anyway, Jefferson Parish is an anomaly. Uh, I think, but I, I, I haven't researched this, I think the lower courts um, have, uh, in a lot of cases, avoided uh, confrontation, well, avoided, avoided the tying dilemma altogether by finding that they're dealing with one product, or they're not dealing with market power, either of which gets them away from the, uh, the ultimate uh, issue. Uh, the only court with which I'm familiar, that has dealt at all with um, the total welfare, consumer welfare distinction, uh, has been uh, the Court of Appeal in Canada, and on remand, the Commission in Canada in the Superior uh, Program case. Are you working on Okay. Uh, and there, it's an extensive treatment, uh, which comes ultimately to the conclusion that it's utterly impractical for the, uh, the courts <coughs> to take into account uh, such, well, such things that could be imported into total welfare as distributive considerations and so on as between consumers and producers. Um, so anyway, there it is. It's the case, that it's the last remaining embarrassment uh, in our <laughs> system. And I think the Supreme Court will avoid it for a long time because it does raise the very issue um, that you've raised. Either one of the Johns have a, have a response to any comments you'd like to make? Well, I will just thank Eric for those fascinating comments, real, genu gen genu genuinely thought out and genuinely interesting, and briefly say that I certainly didn't want, especially on this occasion, to sound too optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be profoundly un <laughs> as anyone who knew Robert Bork would, would, un would understand. So to, to, con to confirm that, I will, I will say that despite letting a little hint of optimism in, at the end, I will now pour water all over it, <laughs> saying that it is it is only it is only the thin and relative virtues that are versions of virtue that are reliably selected for by the American constitutional political system, and I 
Um, and is the glass half full or the water bottle, as Senator Rubio might? Um, is the glass half full or the glass half empty? I don't, I don't know. But to say that some form of principle is selected for, you could do a lot worse. There are countries where they don't even have that. On the other hand, it is a narrow and relative form of principle. I think that that also is, is hard to deny. And the thing we can hope is that there is a not a legal but legal tying between the two kinds. But that is that is nothing more than hope. The other thing that I that I hadn't thought about and I now want to think about more is the is the possibility, especially in contemporary circumstances, this wouldn't have been true a hundred years ago, that because of the way the nomination and confirmation process works, that there is that there is selection against greatness. Because you know, the, the, this is this is a democracy, and one of the things about democracies, right, is that they don't always like greatness. That is a that's a that's a that's a real possibility. I think that it is uh, a a, ne a negative consequence of American democratic politics. If it happens, I think there's a real chance that it happens. I think that's an excellent point. John Adler. I'll, I'll just well, since since this this panel has been been short on anecdotes, I'll tell an anecdote which relates to to uh, Judge Ginsburg's comment about um, the extent to which Bork's uh, work on, on antitrust influenced the academy. Um, when I was a young, untenured professor, I did a paper on um, why antitrust law is bad for fish. Um, basically, that in the, 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 the punchline of it is that in the commons, you want horizontal agreements to restrain output to prevent the commons from being overdepleted, but that such arrangements are, per se, uh, antitrust violation, and there is actually a set of cases um, from the 1930s through 1950s where various uh, uh, fishing groups that tried to restrict uh, output were uh, were challenged under antitrust laws, um, and it continues to have a chilling effect today. Uh, this article was part of my tenure file, um, and my um, uh, committee in decided that, uh, in addition to environmental folks, some some antitrust scholars uh, should. Read this, and they sent the article to one antitrust scholar who I'm, I'm pretty sure does not believe anything valuable in antitrust law had been written after probably 1960. Um, who who sent me directly a copy of his letter, um, the first two thirds of which were you know described what I'd written and then explained why my adoption of Bork's analysis and the analysis of other like-minded scholars was really unfortunate and led to me to some really uh, bad conclusions about what the role of courts should be and whether an arrangement like this should be subject to the rule of reason analysis. But then this is the part uh, that, uh, that is relevant to, to Judge Ginsburg's comment. He said, well, but then he's not really an antitrust scholar. And given that so many people in the field have adopted this sort of erroneous analysis, he's hardly to be faulted for having followed in their footsteps. And, and, and aside from that error, his execution was fine. And, and I, I took that as a, a sign that, that whatever uh, some commentators have said, there are certainly plenty of academics in the field, including some who, who lament, uh, lament the fact, but that note that, that even academics have forced to uh, accommodate and, and follow much of what Port did in antitrust. All right. Well, I think it's time to declare victory. Uh, <laughs> the lunch is directly across the hallway.